When taking a well-earned break from adventuring in the Imperial City, we stop a spell in the acclaimed Tiber Septum Hotel in the Talos Plaza district. Once inside, we see a local mage garbed in white enjoying a drink by himself. Approaching him for a spot of banter, he introduces... Antus Vannon, retired. Sleep late and read trashy books. I don't keep up with the Mage's Guild affairs anymore. Oh? And why is that? I spent 40 years at the Arcane University. Good years, but I don't miss it. Now I'm completely useless and proud of it. Just to pause for a moment, Ontis is an ex-Majors Guild member, and if he seems familiar, it's because we had a less than amicable run-in with Vannon during the quest misdirection in the Thieves Guild questline. <laughs> with that being said, it shouldn't be too surprising that Vannon, in his 40 years of service, may have had more nefarious dealings. And after we've read Modern Heretics or have spoken with Yulaine Lervu in Shadenhall, we can unlock previously hidden dialogue with the mage and ask, Reading trashy books, eh? I happened to source modern heretics recently, not for the faint of heart. Read much about nearby Daedra shrines? I've heard there's a Veramina shrine at the headwaters of the Reed River, though I've never been there myself. You too. Leaving Vanon to his leisurely lifestyle, we can further hear rumours about this shrine of Vermina if we visit Luther Broad's boarding house in the Elven Gardens district where the eponymous owner, Luther, greets. Hello. Luther Broad's boarding house. I'm Luther. You want beds or food? See me. Hello, good sir. I was just looking for some libations, and perhaps the local Daedra to offer it to. I don't trust you enough to talk about that. Yes? Does this help? That will get you something. Now, you were saying about Daedra shrines nearby. Daedric shrines nearby? East of the city, at the head of the Red River, is a shrine to Vermina. Take care. Taking the innkeeper's word as he keeps our coin. Riding east of the Imperial City, we find a small clearing overlooking a basin of water that must be Lake Popad. It's there we find three worshippers below a shrine, depicting an aged female mage, complete with flowing robe with deep sleeves and a three-pronged wizard's staff. Approaching the seated Imperial commoner, Aviera Nirol, she shares. I have seen everything. After you've seen through Vermina's eyes, nothing can frighten you. Similarly, Redguard commoner Tenville saunters over to add. I have mastered my fears. There is no terror to compare with what Vermina has shown me in my dreams. No fear thanks to nightmares? How is that possible? Searching for answers, we seek out the nearby priest, Amar Dua, loitering behind the lectern, and he probes. Who are you? Who dares to walk in the House of Shadow? What business do you have with the Lord Vermina? I actually was trying to learn more about the deity you worship. Here we worship Vermina, praying for her to grant us true visions. What is your business here? We can then say, I have no business here. Then perhaps you should go lest Vermina take interest in your dreams. Otherwise, I wish to speak to Vermina and perhaps grant her favor. To speak with Vermina, you must offer a black soul gem to the Deidre Lord. Vermina, I wish to speak to Vermina. Go Vermina. Then. Ignoring the Dunma, if we approach the shrine empty-handed, a pop-up reads, you do not have the proper offering Vermina requires. Leaving the camp, our quest then updates. Vermina's followers have told me that an offering of a black soul gem is needed in order to summon the Daedra. You must be level 5 to begin this quest. Now for some legwork in procuring an ultra rare black soul gem, as it seems Vermina's favour and powerful Daedric artifact demand an equally powerful tribute. Starting at level 5, there's actually a 10% chance that any necromancer adept or necromancer boss will be carrying a black soul gem in their inventory. So, we could go necro hunting in one of their numerous dungeons around Cyrodiil. Just as an overview for the uninitiated, black soul gems are magical items from the necromancy school. Unlike regular soul gems, black soul gems can be used to trap the souls of humanoid races of Tamriel versus creatures which are trapped in regular soul gems. Now, you could be forgiven for wondering, 
how does one obtain the taboo black soul gem? Well, the rituals necessary to create said soul gems are revealed during the Mage's Guild quest, Necromancer's Moon, which we will soon explore in a series of its own. However, it's not actually necessary to do any of the Mage's Guild storyline to create black soul gems. However, you don't innately learn how to do so until then. Now, the procedure is as follows. First, we head to one of these locations. The Dark Fisher, northwest of Doomed Mine. Fort Isteris, east of Kavach. Fort Lynchel, northeast of Kavach, or Wendelbeck, at the headwaters of the Panther River. Outside of each of these locations, we'll find a white altar draped in a red cloth. You must then wait for the correct day, namely the Shade of the Revenant, as black soul gems can only be created during this special event. Well, how do you know it occurs? Well, as part of this phenomenon, a purple light shines down from the sky on each of the four necromancer altars. The Shade of the Revenant occurs on the same day at all four locations, and it happens every eight days, starting from the first day of the game, i.e. the day on which Uriel Septim enters your cell in the tutorial. Which is kind of amazing that, as the Emperor dies, the Revenant Moon of Manamarco is upon the land, or its cycle begins. Again, the bizarre and captivating story of Manamarco becoming a celestial body and blessing necromancers across Tamriel every eight days is a tale for another time, and tied to the Major Skill questline. However, leveraging this supernatural occurrence, we require, for now, two items. One, an empty grand soul gem, which unfortunately Azura's star cannot substitute. Although we can fittingly locate one in the Imperial City's own arcane university in the Archmage's lobby, no less. Number two is our mysticism skill at level 25 or above to perform the soul trap. Now, once we have both items, we'll head to one of the four necromancer altars, in this case, the Dark Fissure. And when the time is right, we see a beacon of light shine down on the necromancer's altar, where we place the grand soul gem and cast Soul Trap, after which we're gifted the Forbidden Black Soul Gem. Returning to the shrine, we offer the Dark Gem to the Daedra Vermina, the Dreamweaver, and she responds. We meet again, mortal, for we have met before, whether you know it or not. When you mutter in your sleep, you speak to me. When you wake and wet with sweat, you've just left my house. I dwell in your dreams. I savor your nightmares. Now you will serve me. The wizard Arkfed has the orb of Vermina. Snatched from the dreams of my followers and dragged into the waking world. Travel to his tower and retrieve my orb. Take care, though, mortal. In my orb, Arkved has found more than he bargained for. Pondering on how dreams could make it into the waking world, or how a man could steal an orb from her followers' dreams. Approaching Amar Dua, he responds. Vermina has spoken to you. Surely you are blessed. We serve her will. Tenville then brushes off. We don't want more worshippers. We just want to be left alone. Go carefully. And Aviera simply states. Her eye is upon you. Seeing Arkved's tower is due south, we begin our short ride, and our quest updates. After I left an offering of a black soul gem, Vermina's followers summoned the Daedra, who spoke to me. Vermina told me of an orb that had been stolen by the wizard Arkved. I am to travel to his tower, retrieve the orb, and bring it to Vermina. Arriving at the sizable stone fort, we enter the open tower and find by a nearby support strut a sun-bleached skeleton, and in the clearing, the lopped torso of an unknown body. Outside a few paltry chests, there seems to be no signs of life or value in the dilapidated ruins. To the southeast, however, we then see an old wooden double door 
that leads to Arkved's subterranean lair. Once inside, we head down a narrow corridor, hoping to pounce on the unsuspecting wizard. Instead, we find an eerily empty dining hall, all the cutlery laid out for multiple guests, yet no signs of food or life. In the next room to the southeast, we find an empty large area littered with cobwebs. Looting the contents of the two nearby chests, it's only as we move to exit. We then pause, sensing something amiss, and look up to see a queer, exact replica of the room we had just entered, however upside down and suspended on the ceiling, as if it were the floor. It's then we grasp, something terrible and unnatural is happening here. Opening the next room to the southeast, we peer into the darkness, only to be rammed by a clan fear. <laughs> Felling the foul foe and its kin, we look around the room to see what appears to be lava pouring through the walls and has hardened on the floor. Heading down a small set of stairs, we then enter Arkved's void. Stepping into what feels like we have been transported outside of Mundus entirely, the zone resembles the bridges connecting the towers in the plains of oblivion. And while collecting some gold and greater soul gems is a welcome boon in a nearby chest, we also find falling into the pitch black void will only net us eternal darkness and sudden death. <laughs> Instead, we race across the treacherous platforms and find a similar door on the other side with a mirroring chest containing similar items. Disoriented, we start to lose any semblance of direction and are relieved to be free of the void as we enter Arkved's Lost Halls. Inside the Lost Halls, we see trees growing from the floor itself, reaching to the ceiling, and contend with a trio of clan fear. Post dealing with the Daedra, we locate multiple exits to explore, one to the northeast and a second southwest up the stairs. Heading first to our right, or the west, we encounter the now all too familiar Daedric claws protruding from the ceiling with gore strewn across the floor. More clan fear pounce at our intrusion. To the southeast, we then enter an old wooden door leading to a twisted and nightmarish version of a dining setting and bed, with a flame Atronach lobbing fiery missiles between the furniture. Instead of exiting via the southeast door, we can then about face and find in the southwestern corner of the room a tiny trap door leading to Arkved's oasis. Stepping out of the room, we see a hellish plain of oblivion, and it's only when examining where we are in this desolate nightmare do we realize that we are facing an exact replica of Arkved's tower. It's then we also realize the extent of Vimina's punishment as Arkved's nightmares seem to have spilled into the waking world. Truly a twisted torment to endure, but what of the wizard himself? Now it should be noted, if we had entered the southeastern door in Arkved's lost halls that we'd skipped previously near the trees, we could have instead entered the oasis high up on a precarious wooden ledge jutting out of the tower, which, with high enough acrobatics, could be skillfully plunged, or at least semi-skillfully. and then we could appear via the trapdoor in the dining room, skipping the bloody Hall of Daedra in the process. We then push on southeast to Arkved's Hall of Changes. Inside, we find more Daedra, with an ever-watchful, unwelcome Dark Wellkind stone by their side.
Defeating the enemies saved the stone. We open the northern door to find it blocked and descend into a nightmarish maze, encountering yet another Atronach who seemed to be guarding several dead bodies on slabs that looked to have been recently had an autopsy performed on. And in the middle of the room lies a trapdoor to Arkved's retreat. Arkved's retreat, we learn, showcases more of the accursed wizard's nightmares made real, and is merely a single platform with nothing but a restoration chest and ladder. The surrounding area is pitch black in all directions, with only the macabre sight of several rotten corpses dangling from ropes, some of them on fire to light up the place. While it is possible for the foolhardy to jump on a few of the unlit pillars, it is impossible to get back up and a fall will lead to certain death in the void. Returning to the Hall of Changes and pressing southeast, we locate the penultimate zone of horrors, aptly titled Arkved's Rending Halls. This zone is a blood-soaked and completely straightforward corridor, filled to the brim with Daedra enemies and unanimated zombie corpses clamped to the walls. Past the slew of Atronax, we find the floor littered with zombie corpses, the flesh rend from their bodies. To the northwest, we come across a trapdoor to the final zone, Arkved's Death Quarters. Opening the ancient port Cullis, we see in an amalgam of previous nightmares spilling into the Major's private quarters. To our left, we then locate the slumbering Ultima atop his bed caged by Daedra claws, but looks wholly unmolested by the Daedra themselves. We then rustle the elf to see he's soundly unconscious, moreover, asleep, possibly trapped in a nightmare. Although we could simply kill the mage, this is not actually the intended outcome of the quest, which we will learn why when speaking to Vermina. And instead, we see in the eastern end of the room a small table holding two books, some candles, a letter, and Vermina's prized orb. The handwritten note reads, a note written in a trembling hand. There is no world so great as the world of the mind. There is no voyager so well-traveled as the traveler in the land of dreams. There is no abyss so deep as the well of terror that lies within each of us. I have plumbed its depths. I've seen the unthinkable. I am unafraid. Even death's boundaries do not confine me. I am the lord of limitless space and the master of place and time. Through the doors of sleep, the universe lies waiting for me. I will no longer wait for my dreams to carry me worlds away to unknowable deeps, to unspeakable vastness. I shall dwell in the house of Vermina forever, the orb my companion. There is no compass to my destination, no end to my journey. My mind is the eternal voyager fearless and wild with wonder in the halls of horror. Oh, something tells us his horrors have only begun. And we turn to liberate the orb and our quest updates. I've retrieved the orb of Vermina. I should now return it to the shrine. Exiting the tower under the gloom enveloping the hills, we return to Vermina's shrine and the Dreamweaver greets. My orb is returned, and Arkved will live out the rest of his days in nightmare. It is fitting. You have proved yourself, mortal. It is fitting as well that you should bear my token. A quest then updates. Vermina was pleased that I returned the Orb of Vermina. I have been rewarded with a Skull of Corruption. The Daedric Prince's artifact in hand, the Dark Elf bids us farewell. Your business with Vermina is complete. Tremble should she visit you in your dreams. True dreaming, Skullbearer. 
The Daedric Artifact Skull of Corruption is one of the most useful and devilishly inventive artifacts, as it creates an identical clone including equipment of almost any NPC that you hit it with. The target NPC will usually be immediately hostile to their double. Firing the staff at a friendly NPC is unfortunately considered an assault, even though it doesn't actually hurt the NPC. However, if the clone kills the NPC, this is not counted as murder by you. What follows is the target NPC fighting with his or her clone, and maybe with you too. The clone then disappears after 30 seconds. Now, remember how I said sparing Arkved was best? Well, what if we don't allow Vermina to haunt him for eternity? but instead use our new Staff of Corruption on his sleeping self. Well, a copy of the wizard will attack his unconscious double all the while taunting him. I'll hack you to- And it's almost like seeing a bird attack itself in a mirror. With Arkved slain, his double is no more, and we can lift off his corpse the semi-precious White Mage's outfit. It should be noted, the Skull of Corruption is an immensely satisfying item to use on the many citizens of Cyrodiil. And if you want to see A, their fighting prowess in action, and B, when they're particularly mouthy, so you want to see them taunt themselves instead of you for once, of course, those marked as essential can never be truly killed, but after hearing him speak, still definitely worth the hassle. Die, damn you! Why won't you oh. die? Ha! Die, damn you! This ends here! Let's ah! get this over with. Excuse me. The Empire doesn't run itself, you know. Submit a complaint to the usual department, and I'm sure someone will take care of it.